You know, we have had an exceptional and incredible week this week. On Tuesday, our SPPRC, along with our charge conference, confirmed uh, Danny's request to be uh, continuing his process to be a local licensed pastor. So that was uh, pretty exciting stuff that happened on Tuesday night. On Wednesday night, we had a preschool graduation with like 500 of our best friends, right? I mean, it was packed in this place. So many adorable little preschoolers walking across the stage. Uh, all those lives impacted by Shiloh. I mean, that's an incredible outreach ministry here. This week on Wednesday night, uh, Pastor Dave started a new Bible study called When God's People Pray. Um, and already it has impacted folks in Price Hill. And then yesterday, over 50 people gathered for the Change the World Day at Price Hill. And uh, we were in all kinds of places and spaces, praying and working with block ministry and people cleaning out the space itself. And then some of us doing a community cleanup. Uh, I happened to be on the team that was cleaning up in the community. And let me tell you, there was something that happened that was so surprising. Nearly every single person that we encountered along the way said thank you. And not just, oh, thanks for what you're doing, like generosity over the top. We are so thankful that you are out here doing this thing for Jesus. I mean, th we were encountering uh, this guy. His name is Hot Rod. Hot Rod was walking past us, and he stopped, and he told us that uh, he's had five heart attacks, and he's out walking, as he does every single morning, his 20 blocks in his community. And he was saying that usually he brings bags with himself so he can pick up trash as well. But he was so grateful that we were out in the neighborhood and cleaning out the neighborhood. And it was just incredible to have this encounter with Hot Rod. But it wasn't just Hot Rod. I mean, person after person just lavishing us with gratefulness. In fact, there was a lady who stopped her car, rolled down her window, told us thank you, and started clapping. Right? I mean, started clapping because she was so excited about what we were doing. We were absolutely welcomed in the Price Hill community. It was such a moment of grace. Such a moment of grace. Incredible. I mean, the Holy Spirit was all over the place. A moment of grace where we just realized, you know, this wasn't just about what we were doing. It's about what God has already done in this community. And we get to be a part of it. And so it was just incredible to be a part of the Change the World Weekend. Well, God is all over this place. And God's kind of been all over us, uh, all over this sermon series, really pushing us and prodding us. And, and last December, when uh, the pastoral staff and I went on retreat to plan this sermon series, we were talking about this true-false sermon series and talking about, wanting to talk about things in the Bible that just uh, Jesus didn't say that we think that, uh, or things in our culture that we think that are in the Bible that Jesus didn't say, and, and yet uh, we, we quote them as scripture, things like, God doesn't give us more than we can handle, and God helps those who help themselves, and last week we talked about cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, when we were retreating, we thought, three, that'll be enough. We're going to do three, and that's going to be it, and yet there's one more phrase in our culture that we just really felt like God was pushing us, pushing me, to preach. What's that phrase? Well, hate the sin, love the sinner. Hate the sin, love the sinner. It seems in our culture we've been using this phrase a lot here lately. Uh, folks really like to put themselves kind of in different categories, maybe drawing dividing lines, being on the right or wrong side of something, uh, making sure that something is sin or not sin. And so we use this phrase in our culture, and we say with kind of boldness, hate the sin, love the sinner. What does that even mean? right? I mean, what does that mean? What do we mean when we say that? I mean, how can we hate or love something when hate is part of the equation? What, what, is, what does it mean? Honestly, a lot of times we use that phrase because we want to be right in our position. And so we, even as Christians, kind of use that phrase to beat each other over the head with it. You know, really loving thing to do, right? I mean, this is the kind of way we use these kind of phrases in our culture. Well, it doesn't come from the Bible. Jesus didn't say it. In fact, its origins are with St. Augustine. But it, we use it as kind of a summary of Jesus' love. But it falls short. It falls short. You know, a lot of times we use that phrase because we want to be right. It feels good to be right. And so we want to be right in our position. But that's not love. And Jesus was pretty crystal clear about love. Take a look at John chapter uh, 
chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So church, we're called to love, period. But what does that look like? Well, this morning we're going to look at a story in the Bible that just is a glimpse of Jesus' crazy, audacious love. It's an interesting story. that It's about judgment and, and sin and love and grace, and it's found in John chapter 8. So if you would, uh, pull out your Bibles to, or pull out your sermon notes and turn with me to John chapter 8. If you have a Bible from the gathering space, it's found on page 746. John chapter 8. Now, here in John chapter 8, Jesus is teaching at the temple. You may recall that the temple is the most holy space for Jews like Jesus on the face of the planet, right? A holy space that's more than just a church. It's a space that actually inhabits the presence of God. The presence of God was thought to be in the temple. And so Jesus is teaching at the temple. And when Jesus is teaching at the temple, all these crowds are gathering. And it's a crowd full of, well, interesting people. Sinners and misfits and tax collectors and religious people and all kinds of people in, in between. I mean, Jesus is gathering this extraordinarily interesting group of people around him. And it's in that context of teaching that the Pharisees, you know, those super duper religious folks, they come and they want to trick or test Jesus. And so they come and they bring this woman and they literally throw her on the ground before Jesus. This woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, this is interesting. If you go back to the Old Testament, the only way that you could accuse a person of adultery is to actually catch them doing it. And so it's very interesting that they bring this woman before Jesus and they throw her on the ground. Last time I checked, there's more than one person in this equation, right? One person in this equation, and yet they are determined to humiliate her and Jesus in the process, right? I mean, they want to be right. They want Jesus to draw lines in the sand. And so they bring this woman before Jesus. Now, can you imagine what's going through this woman's mind? I mean, she's got to be terrified. She doesn't know if she's going to die. She doesn't know if she's going to live. She's got to be filled with regret and humili uh, hu humiliation and, and fear and anger and frustration. She is scared to death. And these men, they're, they're hurling insults over her. I mean, they don't care that she's there. It's as if they're ignoring her very presence. All they care is that she's a means to an end. They want to trap Jesus. They want to trap Jesus. And so this is what they say to Jesus. Take a look at John chapter 8, verse 4. They're, ho they're literally like hovering over the woman when they say to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? Now, this is very clever. They have the evidence. They have the woman. They have trapped Jesus. Jesus has one thing he can do. He can respond, right? He can answer their question. He has one thing that he can can do. And yet Jesus refuses. He refuses to answer. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus kind of kneels down and starts riding in the dirt, riding in the sand. I mean, they want Jesus to give them an answer and give an answer now. And now Jesus kneels down and starts to write. Now there's all kinds of speculation as to what Jesus is doing. You know, this is a moment where you want the Bible to just give you more than it gives you, right? You want the Bible to spell it out. What is Jesus thinking? What is he writing? What is he doing? Do we get any of that? No, right? A lot of people think that maybe Jesus is just buying a little time, right? Trying to think about what to say, what to do. Or, or there's even a theory that, you know, magistrates, before they gave their sentence, would actually write out that sentence. 
And so maybe Jesus is writing his sentence in the dirt. Or maybe, just maybe, Jesus is getting eye level with that woman to calm her fear, to let her know he's there. We don't know. And the Pharisees, frankly, they don't care because they just keep asking Jesus question after question after question. And finally, Jesus is so fed up with them that he stands up and he says this. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Silence. Nothing. And one by one, those Pharisees drop their stones and they walk away. One by one, they, they drop them so, their stones. They realize that, man, they haven't, they haven't cornered Jesus in the way that they wanted to corner him. And they drop their stones and they walk away. And it leaves behind Jesus and the woman in the crowd. And looking at the woman, Jesus says to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. A lot of us know that as go and sin no more, right? Church, this story rips my heart out because when I think about the story, I realize that I could find myself a character in any one of those groups, right? There have been times in my life when, when I've been holding a stone ready to whirl it at someone because I thought I was right about something, right? I mean, ready just to nail them. There have been moments in my life when I was in the crowd just watching all of this unfold. And there have been moments in my life where I was sitting in the dirt, just like that woman, not knowing what was going to happen next. All of us have found ourselves in these moments. And when we declare, hate the sin, love the sinner, it just doesn't cut it, right? It's just not enough to capture the audacious, crazy nature of Jesus' love. So how do we talk about Jesus' love? In a way that holds those, that love and, and judgment and tension. How do we talk about it? Well, first, let's talk about sin. Now, church, sin is real. A lot of times, uh, I find myself once in a while wanting to avoid the language of sin. Uh, in our culture, there are times that even pastors want to not talk about sin, but I think that's not helpful. It's helpful as human beings for us to tell the truth about ourselves. That's helpful. 1 John 1.8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We are sinners, period, right? Every single one of us, we are sinners. Sin is a part of our lives, a part of who we are as human beings. Several years ago, I, I found myself in a, in a situation where I, I was listening to a guy named Bart Campolo. Some of you may have heard of his father, Tony Campolo. He's an evangelical uh, preacher and teacher and, and professor. And, and Bart uh, is the founder of an organization called Mission Year, where young people go and live in urban settings for a year and, and kind of live life with people and try to live out what it means to love people when, it, when you're following Jesus. And Bart actually lives here in Cincinnati in an intentional community called the Walnut Hills Fellowship. And so... Bart was speaking for this conference on mission. And when he was speaking at this conference, he said, you know, as holy people, we were in a Christian context, we really need to tell the truth about ourselves. So it's real. It's a real part of us, our lives. And so he went on to tell this story about a group of guys that were hanging out at work. And, and he was with them, and they were talking about sin and the nature of sin in their lives. And he said, you know, what happen, would happen if if you could get away with sin, you know, what would happen if you could cheat on your spouse and no one knew would find out about it? I mean, slam dunk, you know, everything is just as you imagined it and no one would find out. Would you do it? And in his like authentic honesty, Bart was like, heck yeah, you know, I would do it. 
I'm thinking to myself, absolutely, if no one would find out, no one get, would get hurt. I mean, it was, a, it was a done deal. Yeah, I think I would do it. But then one guy in the group pop, piped up and said, I would know. The other people looked at him saying, what do you mean you would know? He said, I would know. Every time I looked at myself in the mirror, I would know. And because I knew it would affect my life. And because it affected my life, it would affect my wife. And because it affected my wife, it would affect my children. And because it affected my children, it would affect everybody around me. I would know. And then Bart said, you know, my sin just doesn't wreck me. My sin wrecks the world. Church, sin is real. It has real life consequences. It's real. It's what we call our, our habits and our hang-ups and our addictions and our mistakes. It is real. It's real. But there's this interesting thing, this fuzzy thing about sin in our lives as Christians. Uh, when we go to the Bible, it's not always clear. You know, we want to live in a world of black and white, but sometimes when we go to the Bible, it's super gray. Amen? I mean, it's gray. There are things that we find in the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. It, it shapes us. It, it defines who we are and whose we are. I mean, the Bible has a clear claim on our life. And yet, when we read through the Bible, we recognize we don't follow all the rules and regulations. I mean, we can go to the Ten Commandments. You know the Big Ten? Love the Lord your God, you know? No other gods before me. Don't kill, don't steal. Don't covet your neighbor's stuff. All that kind of stuff. I mean, that, the Big Ten, I mean, we can say, okay, that we can get. But then there are 612 laws of Moses. 612 of them. That's what these Pharisees were referring to when they were talking to Jesus about this woman. One of those laws of Moses. Well, we don't follow all of those. But not all of those lay claim on our lives. What do we mean? Well, take a look at Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. It says, Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Because they have cursed their father and mother, their blood will be on their own head. Now, as a parent, I'm just telling you, there might be moments that I want to kill my kids, right? But there is no moment that I really want to kill my kid. I mean, no matter what my children do, no matter how awful they become, no matter what mistake they make in their life, I will never, ever want to see them die. Ever. Right? I mean, this is a law that we do not follow. We wouldn't even consider following it. It seems barbaric to us. And yet, it's in the Bible. So how do we wrestle with these rules and regulations? What ones matter to us? What ones lay claim on our lives and what ones don't? We need a lens, something by which we look through or, or filter stuff through to help us understand sin in our lives. Well, Jesus gave us a pretty good one. When talking about rules and regulations, someone asked, what's the most important one? And this is what Jesus said. The most important one, Jesus said, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. This is it. This is our filter. This is the lens by which Jesus is calling us to look at ourselves and others and the world. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. This is how we can see sin from not sin. Now, do you think that the Pharisees, when they hurled that woman on the ground, they were loving their neighbor as themselves? Or loving God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? Absolutely not. They wanted Jesus to take a stand, to draw that line in the sand. They wanted to be right, right by the law, right by God. I mean, they were obsessed with having the right answer. And yet, Jesus refuses to pick sides. He refuses to pick sides. What does Jesus choose? 
In this moment, in this moment of history, what does Jesus choose? He chooses grace. Now, grace is more than what we say when we're gathered for a meal. It's more than a woman's name. Grace is the unconditional, unbelievable love and mercy of God. It's nothing that we earn. It's nothing that we do. But, but grace is God's crazy, audacious love. You may not realize it, but in this moment, Jesus could have hurled a stone at this woman, right? He was without sin. He who is without sin cast the first stone. I mean, Jesus didn't have any sin. He could have hurled a stone at the woman, but no. What does he say? Where are your accusers? Where are they? Now, if they don't condemn you, neither will I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Church, we've got to choose grace. Not because, you know, sin has its natural consequences. The reality is, Sin has consequence. But we've got to choose grace so that people can actually experience the audacious love of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus doesn't leave us or the woman there. No, Jesus makes the declaration that sin does not win. Sin never wins. Our mistakes, our past, our habits, our hang-ups don't control us, and they can't lay claim on our lives. Jesus said to the woman, go now and leave your life of sin. Don't do this anymore. Don't live this way anymore. Go and leave your life of sin. You know, church, there is something deep within me. That once, I just got to be honest, I don't care about being right or wrong. I don't. That's not what I'm obsessed with. What I'm obsessed with is actually seeing lives transformed by this audacious love of Jesus. I want to see transformation. Just this week, I've been reading a book by Jim Cimbala called uh, Fresh Power. In the book, he tells a story of a, a guy named Michael. Now, Michael uh, worked for the family business. When he got out of high school, his, his father owned this gourmet pasta, pasta shop in, in Brooklyn, New York, right? And he was fabulous at the business. In fact, he was really good at making money. 18-year-old kid, great at making money. And so his father let him do whatever he wanted to do, as long as it didn't affect the business. 18-year-old kid, Lots of money, able to do whatever he wanted to do. He got himself in trouble. He started to do drugs, cocaine, meth, you name it. I mean, he had a heavy drug addiction. He was living the high life. He bought whatever he wanted. He had this girlfriend named Maria. They'd go all over the world, places like Bora Bora. I mean, they were everywhere, everywhere. They lived this incredibly fast-paced, high lifestyle, loving every minute of it. Until one day, he and Maria found themselves on the beach, and she turns to him and says, you know what, I wonder if there's more. I wonder if there's more. Would you consider going to church with me? Now, that made him mad, right? But he didn't say anything because he wanted to enjoy the rest of his vacation. And so when they got back to New York, she drug him to church, drug him to church. Now, he was going to do his best to be himself, and so he wore the most audacious outfit he could possibly choose, and when it was time in the service to glad hand everybody, to greet one another, I mean, he was over the top, making sure that every single person noticed he was there. But he didn't want to be there. In fact, he had already, like, determined that they were going to go to the club and, and do some drugs, and he had already worked it out. He was ready to go after the church service back to the club and do some drugs. And then the preacher started preaching about Jesus and his crazy love and his grace and the way that Jesus' love transforms a life. And he said, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But all I know is that suddenly I knew who I was. Sin was real to me. 
And I found myself and my girlfriend found herself kneeling at the altar and we were giving our lives to Jesus. And not only were we giving our lives to Jesus, but then the preacher prayed, this prayer anointed us and claimed us and said, you know what? These two young people are gonna do great things for Jesus Christ. And that night, he went home and he threw out all the drugs, all the junk in his life that was holding him back. And he started going to church. And he and his wife, or he and his girlfriend got married. And a few years later, when there was this opportunity to do the satellite site in their church, they felt God calling them to this. And so Michael became the senior pastor of Christ Tabernacle Church, birthed out of Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. And they have 2,000 people worshiping there. Now, church, that doesn't happen because we're like beating each other over the head, trying to make sure that people know that if they're in the right or the wrong. No, that happens because of the audacious, crazy love of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing I've ever witnessed in my entire life that actually transforms lives. That takes people who are walking this way and helps them walk a completely other way. And when we say, love the sinner, hate the sin, it just doesn't capture it. It just doesn't capture it. You know, there have been moments in our lives. Maybe we've never been like Michael. We grew up in the church, and so we've not been that wild. <laughs> and yet, we all need God's grace. We all know who we are. We all need that crazy, audacious love. And we need to be reminded that we are claimed by God no matter where we've been, no matter where we're going, no matter who we are. God loves us. And there's absolutely nothing we can do about that. You know, that day, I can't help but, but want to sit in the dirt with that woman. I can't imagine what she experienced that day. In one moment, she thought she was going to die. This was it. She was getting everything she deserved. And then this folksy, crazy preacher gave her life, and it changed everything. You know, she's one of the people that I want to talk to in heaven, right? I mean, she's one of the people that I want to say, what was it like to stand in Jesus' presence and know just how dirty you were, and yet how loved by God you are. Church, God loves us, and there's nothing we can do about it. Let us pray. Holy God, there are moments in our lives where we feel like that woman where we think to ourselves, oh, we're getting everything we deserve. There are moments in our lives where we're like the Pharisees and God, we just want to be right. And there are moments in our lives where we stand in the crowd and we watch it all and we don't know what to do. But God, in the midst of it all, you're there reminding us there's grace. It's not cheap. It's not easy. It's not just, oh, one day I'm going to say, you know, I'm done and keep doing it over and over and over again. No. It's a costly grace. But it's a grace that we need to live, to have life, and to have it abundantly. And so God, in this room, pour out your grace over each and every one of us. Pour out your grace. Pour out that audacious, crazy love. Help us to receive it in such a way that we are transformed. 
transformed by your power, transformed by you. Lord God, you love us, and we are trying with all we can to love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. God, we pray this and we claim this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let us stand together and sing our hymn of response.